Standby like use 2 through 33, sound 1, 8 through 7 on deck. Standby Q actors. Electrics, kill the blue run lights, please. Like you too, and sound 1A. Go. From Arizona Theater Company, this is Hang in Focus with your host, John Daniels. Uh, as someone that grew up in Arizona, it's a great way for us to share the work that we do worldwide. And featuring co host Janelle Bragg. That is our responsibility is to reflect what is going on in the world. Streaming live from the State Theater of Arizona. Let's do it. Let's really use this moment to re envision our. Welcome to Hang in Focus, live with Sean Daniels. This is the new Arizona Theater Company. I'm just glad that you're here. On this week's show, Sean welcomes acclaimed director Kenny Leon. Denzel, Denzel, Denzel. He's truly a theater inspiration, and I want to thank all the women of A Raising in the Sun, Anya, Nika, and Sophie. I love you. I love you, Jennifer. To my mother, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to a day when every child in America can have a little piece of theater in their daily educational lives. <laughs> to all the people in True Colors Theater in Atlanta who buy tickets to come see plays in Atlanta, to the folks that buy tickets and, at Hartford Stage and theaters like Seattle Rep and the LA Theater Center, thank you for all the people that get on buses and planes and trains to come to Broadway to see our work. I thank you, we do it for you. And please see the next exciting musical on Broadway. Holla if you hear me. Thank you. And with that, it's a thrilling, thrilling episode. I want to introduce Chanel Bragg, who is my co-host every week to have with us. Hey, Chanel. Hello, hello. It's good to see you and everyone else today. It's good to see you. And I want to introduce the, the man of the hour, really one of the titans of the American theater, someone we are deeply honored to have with us, Tony Award winner, Kenny Leon, who was with us this afternoon. Come on out, Kenny, and show the people where you are. Hello there, sir. What's up, my hero? It's so, so <laughs> grateful to see you, Sean and Chanel. Uh, Sean, you just, you know this, but you know, I, you've always inspired me from the days I met you in Atlanta, at the small theater company. And I was like, this is an amazing artist who, uh, uh oh, sorry, I'm in a hotel room. And um, that's like a job offer coming in. I'm sure that's the way <laughs> Kenny Leon works. Yeah. But I just want to, uh, 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 Sean, I just, uh, I just appreciate you so much and appreciate what you've always tried to do uh, with your work. And you've always tried to, you know, uh, bring people together and use theater as a powerful tool. And to see you in Arizona, I felt with a lot of my friends and folks I know out there. So I just want to, I just want to say congratulations, you know, and uh, if you're out there in that area, you don't know how lucky you are. You're going to get um, you're going to get good theater. You're going to get good conversation and you're going to be challenged sometime. But you're always going to get love, you know, through storytelling. And uh, I appreciate you, man. And anytime you call to say, will I do something? You know, I'm there. So I am <laughs> here. It's, good to be here. it's recorded. So I know. <laughs> Well, you know, and I tell this story a lot, but this is the truth. Like when I was in 1995, right? So a few years ago, I was a baby artistic director in Atlanta and Kenny was running the Alliance Theater. And every event that I went to, Kenny would recognize me in the audience like I was a big time artistic director. And I think like, I think our annual budget at the time was like $80,000. I mean, like it was nothing compared to the Alliance, but you always introduced me like, oh, I see one of our arts leaders in the community is here. And I was like 22 years old running this small theater and uh, it just meant the world. And it's something I've tried to always go forward that it, like it doesn't cost you anything to be generous in that way. And it only lifts up more people and it only made more people realize that there were arts leaders there. And so I think about that constantly and I've always been grateful because it really, I think, elevated just even what the people in Atlanta thought about me and what they thought about the art scene. Well, you, you've always contributed majorly from the time that I met you. So, you know, I knew you was going to be a major player in the country and just thank you for doing the work and thank you for being in the in the army that I'm in, the army to do good through storytelling. And uh, I appreciate that, you know. 
So, um, so can you tell our people just kind of where you are? Like you're in a hotel room, you're working on something. What's, what's the next Kenny so Leon joint? The telephone that rang. Yeah, I'm in, um, I hope I look good. I'm in, the, I'm in, uh, I'm in Los Angeles today and I am actually um, uh, sequestering for a project that I'm directing here for, for Netflix, um, a story about the, uh, uh, Colin Kaepernick story, you know, uh, you know, and, you know, I can't talk very, very much about it, but, you know, Colin uh, has done major things in this country. Um, I mean, just major. And so I get to be a part of that, you know, and get to be a part of Ava DuVernay's company for a minute. And so I'm here directing the final episode of that six part series. And uh, it was before here, I was in uh, on the Apple campus at the Steve Jobs uh, Theater. Uh, actually doing a work, uh, a piece of work for the, um, for the camera, for, for platforms that talk about uh, the racial injustices uh, in our country and sort of focuses on uh, the story of Breonna Taylor and her mother and their relationship. So, uh, you know, I, I've been a part of these major, these major uh, stories um, while we've been in, 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 in lockdown. So part of me feels like um, I'm torn because when I, I, let's see, let me tell, let me go back and tell the whole story. Sure. So on March 12th, I had a show running on Broadway and the name of that show was The Soldier's Play. And we had three, four more performances left. Broadway shut down. So on the 13th of March, I was like, oh my God, I don't know what this means, except for the last 20 or 30 years, last 30 years, let's say, I've owned a home in Atlanta, Georgia, but 80% of my time I was in New York, you know, or somewhere else in the planet, you know, doing a movie or telling stories. And now I go to Atlanta on March 13th, and trust me, my woman hadn't seen me that, <laughs> that consistently in a long time. Yeah. So I'm with her. So I'm home from March 13th until September 25th. The first seven weeks of being home is, wow, I'm a little nervous. I don't know what this means. I don't know when we'll get to go back to work. And if I'm believing everything I see, that means that the theater, the live theater, the most wonderful thing in the world, the most wonderful thing that I've dedicated my life to, is like, that's that's the opposite of 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 the COVID experience. Mm -hmm. it's like, we tell stories in a sacred space where the community gathers to share and grow and mm -hmm. challenge each other. It's like, theater is probably going to be the last thing that comes back. Mm -hmm but it's probably gonna be the most sacred. We'll probably appreciate it more. Um, so I'm thinking like, oh, I'm a little nervous. What do I do? And for the first seven weeks, I'm a creature of habit. So the first seven weeks I said, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna wake up. I'm gonna listen to Mahalia Jackson, who's a gospel singer when, I, when my mother grew up, my mother was a gospel singer. And when I grew up, I we went to church like there's seven days in a week. We went to church eight days. <laughs> and my mother was a gospel singer. So I was like, that was comfort. I said, I'll just wake up and listen to that. That, re, re, that was a safe time when I was living at home, my mom. And, and of course, before that, I was raised by my grandmother until I was like nine or 10, you know, so that's another story. But so I, wake, I would wake up every morning, put on two hours of Mahalia Jackson. Then I would pray for like an hour. And that's longer than I've ever prayed as a human being. I was like, most of my prayers are like, hey, you know, five minute prayers. In fact, when I'm in church, I, I get on people like, why is that guy praying so long? You know, it's like, God hears him. He got to talk to everybody, think everything. So I'm used to praying short and sweet, but I'm praying these long prayers, like an hour. And then I just started, I was reading uh, Ryan Holiday, and he wrote a book called uh, Ego is the Enemy, and Obstacle is the Way. 
And so I'm like, wow, this guy. So I'm reading that because also I use this time to catch up on things I hadn't read in a long time or reading James Baldwin and revisiting writers I like. But I would wake up, listen to Mahalia. Then I would pray. Then I would meditate. And I, and, and I didn't know how to meditate. So I was just like, okay, slow everything down, steal everything, listen to my heartbeat, put everything around you in slow motion, make that, that little insect walk in there, make him walk in slow motion. You know, and I was just like, slow down. I would just steal everything. And I realized I hadn't stealed anything mm-hmm. for like 30 or 40 years. Mm. I'm like, whoa, just sit down and appreciate. It's like my grandmother used to say, you know, sitting on the porch, drinking a cup of coffee, telling stories to me, waiting for the next car to come by, which would probably be an hour from now. And she would sit there and says, baby, it doesn't get much better than this. And what I realized, like, life doesn't really get better than that. Being with a person you like, love, appreciating the time, the moment, rocking in the chair. So you may have a wonderful time with your girlfriend, or you may have an exciting uh, uh, golf game, or you may have, but it's still, at the end of the day, it doesn't really get much better than just sitting on that porch with a cup of coffee. It's the same thing, you know, and you, if you build enough of those memories in your life, then you have a real life worth living. So I would wake up, listen to Mahalia, pray, <laughs> meditate. Then I would read something by James Baldwin or, or Holloway, somebody, I would read, and then I would get, I just got a Peloton bike and I would get on the Peloton bike. So I did that, a creature of habit. I did that for seven weeks. So I was working on mind, soul, and body. For seven weeks, the same routine every day. And the seventh week, talking to your listeners out here, on the seventh week, I get a call from Lifetime, Lifetime uh, Studios. I, the last thing I did for them was I did a, a Steel Magnolias. I did a Steel Magnolias uh, with a wonderful cast. And I said I wouldn't do anything. I, I love that experience. So I didn't want to do anything that I felt was not as great as that experience with mm-hmm. Steel Magnolias. And I get a call, and, 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 and at the same time, Robin Roberts, who was working with Lifetime, they called and said, we want you to do the Mahalia Jackson story. Would you consider that? They had no idea that I had been waking up for seven weeks listening to Mahalia Jackson. They had no idea that I grew up Christian in the South. They had no idea that Dr. King's oldest daughter, Yolanda, was one of my best friends. They had no idea that my mom was a gospel singer. They had no idea that if there was any story I was dying to tell, it was the Mahalia Jackson story from a black Southern Christian loving point of view. And so I ended up doing that story and they said, it's already greenlit for Easter weekend um, it, there's a script, but you can have a writer to make any adjustments you want. And it has to shoot like in October. So long story short, I ended up doing the Mahalia Jackson story. And it goes deeper than that because they had certain ideas about what they wanted it to be. And I was like, if I do it, it has to be this way. My mother would slap me and my grandmother would come from the grave and said, what are you doing? <laughs> so in this particular story, I knew that I wanted to say something about now. And I knew that uh, uh, Mahalia Jackson lived during the first pandemic. I knew she was born in 1911. She was in the pandemic of 1918. She went through the Great Depression of 1929. She lived through World War I and World War II. She worked through the Civil Rights Movement. She was the woman that inspired Dr. King to go to that I have a dream phrase of his speech. He wasn't even gonna say that. He was going on with his speech and he was, it looked like he, he didn't have the audience where he wanted them to. And he looked down at his spiritual confidant, Mahalia Jackson, and she said, Tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And then he says, ah, I have a dream that one day, you know, that's how that happened. So, but the world doesn't know that. So the Mahalia Jackson story I tell knows that. And then the, the Mahalia Jackson story I know, no one knew that I had worked with Danielle Brooks uh, and Shakespeare in the Park. We did much about much ado about nothing. Yes. And 
I, I hired a plus size, beautiful woman, Danielle, who was just taught me so much about identity, uh, about beauty, about respect. And I hired her to play Benedict, I mean, Beatrice. And she would say to me, she turned down a six figure movie to do that because she said, who in America would give me the opportunity to play Beatrice? She did that and during that experience, I learned that she was a powerful singer. She was a great actor. I learned during that experience that her mother was a bishop in the Southern church in South Carolina, that her dad was a deacon, that we had this whole thing. And that since she was uh, 14, she wanted to play Mahalia Jackson. In fact, when she was in Color Purple on Broadway, uh, Jennifer Hudson said to her, you should play, you should play Mahalia Jackson. And, and Daniel and um, Jay Hud is a friend of mine and a friend of, of Mahalia. So, you know, I remember sending a letter to Jennifer Hudson says, hey, you know, we're doing a Mahalia Jackson story with it, you know, and she's like, oh my God, that's great. And, you know, it, it was so interesting because she was doing the Aretha story and she, and some people thought that she should do the Mahalia story, but it's like, Jay Hud has so much love in her heart and she knows what project is for her and what project is for someone else. And so anyway, that's my long about way of saying that I think this, um, project is, is destined. It comes out on, on Easter weekend. Um, and the, the weekend that Dr. King was killed uh, April 3rd and 4th and Easter weekend. So, so you can catch it at eight o'clock. And, but the cast is great. Jacana Calacango, who's a Broadway actress who was in Slave Play, plays opposite her. And uh, Denzel Washington's daughter, Olivia Washington also plays a major part, and uh, Jason Durden, who's a, a great stage actor, is also in it. So it's um, it's a wonderful production. So that's what I ended up doing in September, and then then I went out of that project. I just finished the edit on that, and then I went to do the uh, the, the Breonna Taylor project, and now I'm getting to do the Colin Kaepernick project. And to, for me, it's all it's all tied together. You know what I mean? And uh, sometimes I get I was like, oh, I'm so blessed and grateful to be able to uh, to work. And then when I travel around the world, I do see like, I see the sadness that everybody can't work. You know, I'm so blessed to be able to work. And so I end up like, if I have a driver, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tip him as much as I can. You know what I mean? Cause you know, some people with driving companies have lost their whole company. Mm -hmm. Some people with restaurants have lost their whole restaurant. When I think about Broadway, hopefully that'll come back in uh, the, the uh, end of end of this year. But when I think about Broadway, I, I think about the actors, but some of some actors can make adjustments and do film and television like like we're doing. But what about the ushers? What about, you know, the bartender? What about all those restaurants around Times Square? Everything works on the beauty of, of live theater. So I'm just hoping we can get back to 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 um, to um, to the day when we all can uh, be in our full jobs and contribute like we want to in our country. But I also think that the that the reset was necessary. You know, in my own in my family, uh, my mother lost uh, two brothers and a sister. You know, we lost we lost them uh, two weeks apart. So when people tell me that COVID is not real, it's like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, and so many people in the country have lost family. So we lost that family members during that time. And like my I never really heard my mother cry that much. But when I talked to her, she was like, she was so, her, her voice broke because she says, I can't be there when my brothers and sisters need me most. That's my brother and sisters. And I lived my whole life with them and I didn't get a chance to be there, be there with them when they needed me when they were sick. And then also I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to them in a proper way. It almost feels like, she said, it feels like they're nothing. They're, they're nothing. So not to bring politics in it, so, but I do get upset when, when, when politicians don't value all those lives and we make, um, we, 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 we are part of actions that don't honor all their lives. And I had a friend from Italy call him and says, hey, what's happening in, in, in America? You know, and I said, well, one thing I know about my country, I love it, but I also I, I'm a storyteller and I can look at the truth. Some, some artists want to stand next to truth or beside truth, but never in truth. But if we were to stand in truth now as Americans and as artists, we can see that we don't value human life like we should. If we 
valued human life, there wouldn't be 500,000 deaths. You know, um, there are other values more important to some of us than, than human life. And we need to look at that really carefully. I looked at the, was it Australia Open last week and they had like 16 cases and they shut down the government. They shut things down. They said, okay, no more fans at the tennis match. They shut it down over 16 cases. That means those 16 lives were important. We have 500,000 deaths. If, if life was really important, our actions would indicate that. So I'm, I'm very clear about that. But my point what, that I was getting to is that during this reset, I think even though I lost family, and I know some people lost more than I did, but even though we lost family, even though I miss being in a room with collaborators, you know, working on a play and working on a musical, I, I miss that. Those are things I miss. But I still think that the reset, the stoppage was necessary for us to get to our better selves. And if not, we would still be, we would still be gathering in bars and gathering in places and still not caring about each other and still not loving each other. And I think this time has given us the opportunity to focus, to go inward, to say, what's really important to you? And if, if each one of us could say, what, what, you know, ask that question out loud to yourself, what's important to me? And, and on the other side of this pandemic, am I gonna be better because of that? And I think that it took us that stoppage even to focus on the sadness about race in our country and the sadness about what's happened from 1619 to now. And until we come to grips with those hundreds of years, if we never deal with that, we'll never be able to deal with our future. And um, I, I, I believe that strongly. And um, I get into, um, even now, I, I, I say to folks, after George Floyd's death, you know, it's been a movement happening around the, uh, the country, but I don't want all of our groups to turn on each other. There's like, we need all of that. We need young people, we need old people, we need, we need uh, liberals, conservatives, we need all of us to push this thing up the hill and not to turn on each other, you know what I mean? It's like, a, for me specifically, for instance, I have friends that, were, you know, they use the term uh, BIPOC, BIPOC when they're talking about race relations. And I think that's great. I think that, I mean, when you look at what, 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 our, what we did to Native Americans in this country, mm -hmm. and then if we look at slavery, I mean, look at, and I tell folks about slavery, I said, you know, you guys talk about slavery like it was just like 30 years of time. Let's just forget it. It was just 30 years. No, 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 no. <laughs> if you look at back and you really think about it in, real, in a real way, it's like, oh, that would be like having my great, great grandfather, my great grandfather, my grandfather and my mother and my lives and put all of our lives together, like 250, 300 years we continued slavery for that long. You know what I mean? So it wasn't like, oh, just, we just need this for some uh, free labor. No, 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 no. That's like many, many lifetimes. So that, that's how deep the problem is. So you can't just say, oh, pull yourself up by your bootstrap. No, no, let's deal with that. It's not even about, it's not blaming anybody. It's like, let's deal with that. And so I think that this moment after, uh, after George Floyd, uh, for me, as an artist, even, it's about it's about let's dealing with the black white thing straight on. And I think if you deal with the black white thing straight on, I think that other boats will rise. I am not disrespecting the injustices perpetuated on all brown and black people at all. We got to fight all those battles, but there is something that happens to the black. Uh, black white argument when we bring other um, things into being. We, we almost need to deal with each one of them specifically because we sort of, we sort of, um, we sort of disappear. You know, it's like, nope, we don't want to really talk about that. Yeah. But I think we have a real serious problem with black to white. And we also have problems with every, in every other possible, especially gender. I mean, and I did American Sun last year for Netflix. And I tell you, I've never learned, I've learned from, when I think about it, it's really just a lot of women. 
I've learned from uh, Daniel Brooks, of course, he taught me a lot. I've learned from Kerry Washington, who, who I did American Son with, who just taught me so much about the female presence, the female voice, respecting the woman. You know, and you know, I'm an old cat, but to just now get some of this stuff, I'm like, yeah, I want it. I'm soaking it up. And and then um, uh, Lauren Ritloff, who was a stay-at-home deaf mom, who I hired in Children of a Lesser God for Broadway. She wasn't an actress, and she did this Broadway play, and now she is on the third season of The Walking Dead, and now for Marvel Pictures will be the first deaf, deaf superhero. So I've learned so much from all these women and I hopefully I'll keep learning from women. So I guess my thought for the day is like, we need to just let, let women, you know, run the country and run our households and, you know, and, and, and help us in our theaters. And, you know, you know, we got a, We got a chance if we just listen to women. You know, I'm here for that. Right. 100%. <laughs> and I could also tell that you grew up in the church because you came here preaching today. And I appreciate that. My mom is also a missionary. My daddy's a preacher. So I, I understand very much. I'm sorry. I don't know. I hope I answered the question. I don't remember what the question was, but um, I, I think I, I, I think I asked uh, what, what you're doing next. And that <laughs> oh, you know, was, you know, it was changing amazing. the world. That's you what know, you're doing next. <laughs> so I wanted, you know, taking all that into account, I wanted to talk to you about Holler If You Hear Me. I know you've worked on a bunch of like high level shows that have gone on in Broadway, but I will tell you that is one of my favorite shows I have ever seen ever. I saw it 4th of July and it was a packed house um, of people of all colors to be there. And there is a moment in the show where a character um, decides to not use gun violence and to put a gun down uh, instead of using it. And there was a standing ovation in the middle of the theater. And I have just, you know, going to Broadway, you don't see that type of energy. You don't see that type of audience. You don't see that type of, you know, people so happy to see a character moving that forward. And so I know, you know, maybe that didn't run as long as some of your other things, but I'm fascinated by that experience because I would still put that in my top 10 ever that I've seen. Oh, thank you, Sean. You know, um, did I say it was great to be here with you and Chanel? I mean, I'm just, I'm just inspiring and soaking up. Uh, you're inspiring to me, and I'm soaking up your energy. So thanks for letting me invade your space today. Um, but Holly, if you hear me, was actually one of the best things, uh, but best experiences I've had. You know, and that goes back to uh, when we were trying to decide, you know, if it had a place on Broadway. And the 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 the, the other story to that is um, a Fanny Shakur, who's Tupac's mom. I, I, I met her maybe three or four years before I actually got a chance to work on her son's uh, musical. And um, she was, uh, was going to try to do an art center in uh, Stone Mountain, Georgia to honor her son. And she knew I was an artistic leader there. And, and we, we got along great. I said, you know what? I've always had this thing in my head, like to do a Broadway musical featuring the the words of your son. I don't want to like, and I say, I see it very clearly. I don't see it as, I don't want to get into the East Coast, West Coast thing because, you know, that's a lightning rod for people who, who, who agree with him or who liked him or who want the other side or, you know, I just want, when I look at Tupac, I see August Wilson and Shakespeare, all that combined. It's like, and this cat, man, he had so much, he had so, he left so much. He left all these writings he wrote every day. And I'm like, whoa, if you just could just look at his artistry, it's Shakespearean. And um, she really she really got it. She says, wow, she says, if we ever do that, man, you're the one to tell the story. And so I went, you know, time went on, time went on. And uh, me and her built our friendship. And then uh, uh, Eric Gold had the property. They were going to do a two-part thing for Broadway. And she said, you got to talk to Kenny Leon. And when they talked to me, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to bring on this writer, Todd Kreidler, and I want to do it this way. And they were like, OK. And that's how it happened. But the, the, the thing about Broadway is Broadway, you either have to have the money or you have to have the time in order for something to be successful. And Broadway, you know, it's pre this pre pre this racial thing, wait, racial awakening we're having, you know. Right. My colleagues on Broadway, we have a lot. We have a lot to do to 
to be just and right, to be the place that's sharing everybody's stories. And I think there are a lot of well-intentioned people who want to work toward that. But this was before that. So we didn't have the time to bring the, the audience there, the culture there that was supported, and we didn't have the resources to, to, to educate and build the traditional audience. So it kind of fell in that gap. And I remember one day walking down the street, one night, and um, I had just gotten the closing notice. Like every director hates to get a closing notice. And we all gonna get them at some point. But whenever it comes, it's too soon. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I see um, the uh, educator, uh, Cornell West, getting out of the car. And I know Cornell and Dr. West is getting out of a taxi. He said, Brother Leon. I said, how you doing, man? Doc, good to see you, Doc. And he was in the car with uh, uh, um, um, Harry, um, um, Harry Belafonte, the great activist and artist, the great Harry Belafonte. And Harry was like 90 years old then. He's like 95 now. Been spending a lot of time with him lately, man. I uh, hope we get the chance to put his, his story on stage, man. He's just a mm -hmm. great human being. Uh, and it teaches me how to walk that line of being an activist and an artist. Because at the end of the day, you know, just by being an, an, an artist, by his nature of being an artist, you're an activist, you know, and we have to just remember that that comes with the territory. So they're getting out the car and and they said, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm, man, I'm just disappointed that the, the musical is closing, but thank you for talking to those young folks the night that you went to see the play. And Mr. Belafonte said, what are you talking about? He says, Kenny, we are so proud of everything that, that, that you do. You did Fences on Broadway. We, that was great. And you did A Raising in the Sun. And we, we see all your stuff. And But what you have to remember is that you are presenting Afrocentric work on a Eurocentric stage. And I was like, oh, shit. Check yourself, Kenny Leon. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it ain't about the box office. Sometimes it's about you're just a part of it's a part of something. It's like, I'm a product of generational prayers. You know, my mom, mm -hmm. my grandmother, my great grandmother never saw a play. You know, my grandmother, she saw a play the year before she died, but she used to pray that there are better lives for her grandchildren. You know, so I'm the product of that. And so everything we're doing today is uplifting everything that's come before us. And we have to realize that just because they weren't here to see it don't mean that they didn't have everything to do with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, when he said that, like, you was in Afrocentric work on a Eurocentric stage, I was like, I got it. That's my responsibility. Keep telling these stories. Keep telling stories that no one else knows about. Keep opening doors. Keep listening to young folks. Keep listening to old folks. Keep sharing. Keep listening to white folks. Keep listening to brown folks. Keep listening to women. You know, uh, that's the beauty of being on the planet, you know, and we're all are only going to be here for, you know, these bodies are only designed for, like, 80, 90, 100 years, that's it. So you can't change that. So it's like, what What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to share our stories. And in the theater, hey, it's a raised stage, sharing our stories with the whole community. And if you're on that raised stage, that's great. But if you see yourself not on that raised stage, that's bad. So at, in Arizona and Florida and Georgia and New York, that's what we, we're supposed to build raised stages for everybody. You know, we're supposed to build those raised stages for things that intimidate us. Those of us who are, those of you who are afraid of transgender. No, no, no. You need to tell those transgender stories. We need to hear them. We need to know. We need to tell the gay stories, tell the brown stories, tell the black stories. It, it, we shouldn't be afraid of each other. And um, that's what I want to be a part of and continue to be a part of. The American theater that moves to raising the stage and, and, and telling everybody's story and growing from everybody's story. Cause that's a safe way to find out about each other. You know, it's like, go to the theater, you know, that's safe. You don't have to go to a neighborhood you're afraid of, you, don't have to go to, you know, no, go to the theater. You know, for the most part, we got security, you know, <laughs> don't slap you if you applaud at something they don't agree with, you know, it's, it's a safe place to get to know each other. So I don't know what the question was, but I heard myself <laughs> talking and I'm like, shut up, Kenny, shut up. Uh, Chanel and Sean are running this thing. So, okay, I'm done. What's the next question? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, listen, I could, you just, I just want to bathe in your brilliance just yeah. for, yeah.
Hey, I, just want, I want to make sure everybody sees the Mahalia Jackson story on April yeah. 3rd. I want to make sure that everybody goes to Netflix and check out Amend, which is a, a docudrama with Will Smith and a bunch of other folks like Samuel L. Jackson and Mahershala Ali about the evolution of the 14th Amendment. And some of us can just take time with that because I learned things about, you know, the 14th Amendment. That's like, oh, OK, slavery is over now. Let's, um, you know, we, we, well, we got to give these black folks citizenship. Oh, wait a minute. No, we can't give them citizenship. When, you know, and that's going to throw things out of whack. So let's get, let's count them as three fifths of a person. Then we can get back. OK, so, OK. Oh, so that's where the Electoral College came from. And the Electoral College, you mean how we elected the president? That's based on something that was grounded in how to count slaves. OK, and we're still using that in 2020. Oh. Okay. All right. Okay. And that, but that's in the constitution. It takes a constitutional act of uh, uh, a congressional constitutional act to deal with that. Okay. Hmm. So anyway, but the amend is on Netflix, six part series. See that. And then uh, American son that I did with Kerry Washington last year is on also. So I'm just shamelessly plugging all I of my, uh, my, now, uh, listen, my, I my work, but I think that the work uplifts, empowers and educates. And so I'm hoping you do that. And I'm, I'm really hoping, Sean, you're like, I want to ask you, when do you think, when do you think theater is going to open back up? When, when Chanel, when do you guys think that, when, it, when is it going to be a safe time that we're going to gather in this sacred place and laugh together and clap together and sing together? When is that going to happen? You know, I, I will see what Chanel thinks. I think it's going to happen in the regions this, this fall that we're able to do it, right? Just looking, we have so many patrons uh, who have gotten their second vaccine shot, you know, who are, are moving towards that. And so to be able to do, so I think in the fall, you know, I don't know about Broadway cause that those, you know, I'm not a big guy and those are tight seats. You are crammed in there, you know, to be able to do. So I wonder if that'll be a little bit longer, but I, you know, everything we hear from our people is that they're hungry for it. And I think you're right. They miss it more than they had before. And, you know, listen, the roaring 20s, right, came after the last pandemic. And it makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. you want to be with people. You want to be out. You want to dress up. You want to celebrate. You want to go to a sporting event, you know, that you don't go know. You wanna, yeah, mm -hmm. you want to go see a, um, you've never been to the orchestra. You want to see an orchestra, be able to do it. So I wouldn't be surprised if we don't have the same thing where we just want to celebrate all of these things together to be able to do. Well, my feeling in uh, that, uh, I think um, pretty much some shows will probably start opening in the fall. And I think Broadway will start having full audiences like December. Uh, I think my first Broadway show is set to go like in February or March of 22. So I think it's clear that by March of 22, spring of 22, I think we'll be, we'll be, we'll be back and raring to go. And you know, that play, I did a soldier's play this past season and I was fortunate enough to be nominated for another Tony Award, but they're having the Tony voting uh, March 1st through March 15th. So that's a good indication. So they're voting on, on that. And then they said they're gonna have, they're gonna coordinate the Tonys for last year. They're gonna coordinate that with the opening of Broadway. So uh, that gives me the feeling that sometime, uh, sometimes late summer, early fall, we're gonna be back up celebrating again. And um, I know a lot of people that have got the vaccine. I'm I'm on a list, so hopefully I'll get mine once I get back to Atlanta, who knows. Um, but um, so I'm hoping for that, but I'm hoping that we've learned a lot of lessons uh, in between. I think it's an opportunity, excuse me, um, to reset though. Uh, I feel like um, there was a very elitist mentality around who attends theater and who doesn't. And I think right now we get an opportunity to say, okay, from the door inside, what is the experience that we are creating that shows you this is a safe space? And then when you get inside that these are the stories that we are committed to tell. I feel like now more than ever, we have the opportunity to really shift that. And I know that's important to me. Um, I did want to ask about Kenny Leon's True Colors Theater in Atlanta and the work that's being done. I went to the website and looked around and I'm just really excited about the work that is happening in that space. And can you elaborate a little bit more about that? But I, I'm uh, the first part of what you said is like I, I I do think that we as theater administrators and theater artists that that hopefully we've learned a lot during this, and I think we should be committed to 
telling BIPOC stories and Black stories. Uh, we should be committed to having Black people behind the stage, not just on the stage. Uh, you know, just, you know, American theater is just a microcosm of America. And we got a lot to work on in our country to make it as beautiful as it can. So I'm hoping that, I'm hopeful that theater will take the lead in that. And uh, all the indications are that we, that a lot of us are. So I'm counting on you, Chanel and Sean, to, to, to lead the way in Arizona. <laughs> but um, uh, True Colors is a theater company. You know, when I, I ran the Alliance Theater Company, which is a big $15 million a year theater, ran that for like almost a decade. And then uh, I hadn't planned on starting another theater company, but then me and Jane Bishop founded True Colors Theater Company. And now it's almost in this 18th year. And two years ago, I stepped down as artistic director and, uh, and uh, because I saw this guy, Jamil Jude, who's just, he was one of my associates and he's just, a, he's a great, a great director and a, and a great community guy. And, and I looked at him one day and, and then and, and the theater company had been up and down and all, and I never left in the down parts. I was like, no, I got to stay here through that. And I looked at it one day and I, I looked at him and I was like, Jamil, Jude, I feel like I'm looking at myself. <laughs> and which is so weird, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm not full of myself, but I was like, that guy, he's different than I am, but he's committed to theater. If I turn the theater over, over to him now, he has a board of directors, they have money in the bank, his leadership will take us further, and they're committed to telling African-American stories. And he, where he is now, he he's gonna do way more than I could have ever done. Um, I, everything they do, I'm excited by now. And, I, and I, so I feel like the theater is in good hands. I don't have to, you know, I'm not trying to get them to do what I would do or how I would do it. But we left a good mission statement and great uh, core values, which are my my personal core values: is boldness, laughter, respect, and abundance. You know, do something bold. Try to laugh at least two or three times a day. Uh, respect everybody, especially gender and sex and race, it re respect the differences, you know, and then live in a space of abundance. Don't live in these spaces of scarcity. It's like nothing happens there. You live in scarcity. It's like, okay, okay, well, our work is worth $1,000. No, it's not. Our work is worth millions and millions of dollars. You know what I mean? Our, um, so, so live in abundance. There's enough on the planet for everybody. There's enough water. There's enough food. There's enough audience. There's enough money. There's, it's there. And so I think True Colors lives in that space and those core values have served them well. And I think, I think we or they are in great hands. You know, I'm still on the, um, on the board uh, there with them, but they're doing great stuff every day. And Jamil Jude is a great leader. They still manage and run the August Wilson monologue competition, which is something that we created with ninth uh, through 12th graders when uh, my good friend August Wilson passed away. And I had the blessing to have worked with him on his last three Broadway shows before he passed and and we started that competition in a selfish way of like how do we keep august alive okay i know if we get ninth graders to read his monologues and get on the stage and, and just say his words then august will never die and that's what uh todd kreitler and myself did when we created that competition and we started with one school in atlanta georgia and now we're in 15 states and every year we fly those finalists to atlanta to be a part of that. And in fact, on um, they have uh, something on Netflix called like Giving Voice, which some guys did a documentary on the whole process of that. And this year they had to do it virtually. Uh, but you know, it's a it's a good thing. So yeah, True Colors is great, and it's a uh, it's it's they're great. They're great. So every guest that we have on, we ask them for like a word for like where they are in this moment, right? Which will become the name of the episode that we, when we put it out. So do you have like a word, like if, if there's one word that Kenny Leon keeps in his mind right now to represent where you are, what is it? Gratitude. Gratitude? Gratitude. Gratitude. Grateful. Gratitude. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Gratitude. Yeah, it's like such a great word, right? In terms of like, for all of us that have like such challenges ahead of us, but have so many, the ability to face that, right? That like that pressure really is a privilege at any yep. given moment to be able to work on this. Absolutely I, right. 
I have to ask a question. I'm not going to let this moment go by. Um, but I run a United Colors of Arizona Theater, which is a social justice initiative here in Arizona, of 400 BIPOC individuals that are really um, wanting to have a place in the theater community here. And so both of you, this is to Sean and to Kenny, um, as, a, as a young person starting your own theater, what is the greatest piece of advice that you could give? I, I, it's easy for me because today, you know, all we have is our time and our talent. <coughs> Excuse me. Our time and talent. And um, it's how you spend your time, how you spend your talent. And, uh, excuse me. <coughs> I, um, this morning I started today with a six year old, a seven year old, an eight year old, and a nine year old from young audiences of New York. And so, they just called and asked me, would I spend some time with these young folks, like doing a kind of a workshop through Zoom. And I just found my way, you know, in terms of talking with them. And it ended up, they, if you listen, they can teach you. Because that's when we're at our purest self, when we're five, six, seven, and eight. You know, when we haven't learned the crazy racist behavior or sexist behavior. And I asked them, I said, give me something to go through the rest of my day. I said, I got a bunch of meetings a day. I got a casting call today. I got, you know, all this stuff. What, tell Kenny Leon, and I'm talking to like six year olds, tell Kenny Leon, what, give me, inspire me. And what they said, um, Isaiah said to me was, Mr. Leon, just keep going. Don't stop, no matter what, just keep going. And I know that sounds like a, 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 a sort of a short answer to what you said, but it is instructional. It's like, you know, I can tell in this few moments with you, you're brilliant. Your, your, your intellect, your politic, your vision for what you want. I, it's, it's just there. You don't even have to say anything. You know, there's so many more things more powerful than what comes out of our mouth. It's like, I, and I'm not trying to be weird or anything, but I get that energy from you. you are, it's already there. All you, only thing that can stop you is your own self saying, oh, I can't say that. I'm going to step on some toes. Oh, I'm not, you know, we don't have enough uh, finances over. No, all you got to do is just keep going. Don't stop. You know, don't take, uh, don't take no for an answer. It's like the only thing, if I was my 60 year old self talking to my 30 year old self, it's like what I know now is that everything's going to be all right. It's like the only thing that separates people is like there's some people that do and some people that don't you know what I mean <laughs> do what you can don't what you can <laughs> you know it's like it's it's there it's like these they're lesser less smart people like supposedly are successful but that's not the real judge of like oh they did a bit yeah yeah no no they had the guts to do it to keep doing it and I just think that people, I would say to your group, just, just do it. You get an idea, be bold about it, just do it. America is so, it's just capitalism. It's like, just figure it out, just figure it out. Okay, I want to do this. Now I just got to figure out a way to get paid for it. Okay, wow, just do it. And there are more people out here telling you you can't do it than they are who are going to encourage you to do it. Because people are fearful by their nature. They're fearful. They're, they're, you know, you got people in your own family. Oh, you, oh, in my family. Oh, you, you can't act. You, I can act. I can tell a joke. You, you ain't that. And then when you make it, they're like, hey, I was always there. Yes. <laughs> so you, all I'm saying is like, just keep going. Like, like Isaiah said this morning, he's a six-year-old. Keep going. You know, so mine is about Kenny. I don't even know if Kenny knows this. Uh, or when we started Dad's Garage, you know, one of the, the nice things we did was just try to build like solid relationships with the other theaters, because like every theater community, there had been a lot of like, you know, there's a sense of scarcity. There's a lot of back and forth. This theater does this. How dare they do that? And um, so we just tried to be like, like real colleagues with everybody. And we made a lot of friends at the Alliance. And so we would get calls from the Alliance production manager and actually from Jane Bishop, because we had no money. And so we'd get a call from Jane being like, hey, we're throwing away a Broadway set tonight at 11 o'clock. I'm just saying. 
And so we would go raid the dumpsters of the Alliance for your set pieces. And then we would take them back and then we would repaint them so no one knew. And that's how we afforded to have sets the first couple of years. They were actually all your sets that you were throwing away. And we would just get a heads up from the staff. I think because we were like, we weren't in competition with anybody. We weren't trying to be territorial. We were trying to do something like very specific. We were trying to make theater for people in their early twenties, which nobody else was doing, you know? And I think other people respond, like everybody wants to have colleagues. Everybody wants to be generous. You just often in theater don't get that chance to be able to do it. And so I don't know if you know, but we stole your sets for like okay. three years to be, and like, so if you ever came to anything and it looked familiar, you probably actually had seen it before. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But listen, that, that was also Jane Bishop, right? That's like the way that she lived her life. She was just like, you know, if you're, th if you can, if you have more, you should give it away, right? It was definitely like her way of life. That's good. Yeah. That's right. Well, thank Great. you both for that. That was beautiful. And now I'm going to go hang around some dumpsters. Uh, ah! <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Um, listen, you. Kenny. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It is an Thank honor you. and a privilege. You know, whenever you want to get back to your roots doing theater, we're just, we're one state over. You come on, hang out, come hang. do a show with us. We'd love to is have you. only one state? California. California. From California. Oh, where, I'm in, where I am today. Oh. Yes. That's right. That's right. Not from Georgia. <laughs> yeah. We're a few states from Georgia. Yeah. Well, continued success to you both. And I love you guys. And um, thank you. Uh, time well spent. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. Later. Have a good day. Oh. He, yeah, one of the titans of our field, definitely to be able to do it. <laughs> For sure. I, I told you guys this privately, but I'll tell the audience. So my brother Mitchell, as my godbrother lives in Memphis, Tennessee, and he started his own theater company, and I'm super proud of him too. Um, and he has never watched our show in the however many months I've been on. And then I get a text message, Kenny Leon is going to be on focus so um hi mitchell thank you for watching today and i expect you to also watch next week <laughs> amazing all right well uh next week coming up we have christina ham yes who we're really is excited. the writer of nina simone for women which we are doing in our upcoming season when we get back so that should be thrilling excellent well we hope you have a wonderful weekend and stay tuned for this week's call board thank you thank you everybody This is your call board for January 19th to the 25th, 2001. Hi, I'm Will Rogers, Community Engagement Manager at Arizona Theatre Company, and thank you so much for joining us today on Hang and Focus. We hope you enjoyed this week's show, where Sean and Chanel caught up with acclaimed director Kenny Leon. Now let's find out what's happening on future episodes of Hang and Focus Live. Next week, Sean will sit down with Christina Hamm, playwright of Nina Simone, Four Women. That's February 26th. On March 5th, we'll be joined by National Latinx Playwriting Award winners of the past as our celebration of Romero Fest is well underway. And that celebration will continue on March 12th when Karen Zacharias will join us. She is the playwright of Native Garden. So don't miss those exciting episodes of Hang and Focus Live coming up. And if you miss us on Friday at four o'clock Arizona time, you know what? You can see this any other time on uh, Facebook or on YouTube. So there's no excuse, don't miss them. And now we're going to head on over to the Giving Corner and see what Stacey J has for us. Hi, everyone. My name is Stacey J Cavalier, and I'm the Development Events Manager at Arizona Theatre Company. On behalf of the entire team at ATC, I wanted to wish all of our friends and colleagues a huge congratulations to those nominated for 2021 Governor's Arts Award. We are so proud to stand alongside you as a performing arts institution here in the great state of Arizona. We applaud your commitment and contributions to the excellence of Arizona's arts and cultural community. I'd also like to thank all of our supporters and patrons for standing by ATC. I look forward to meeting many of you when we were all able to return to live theater later on this year. Thank you so much for your support. Back to you, Will. Thanks, Stacey J. Now, let's see what's happening in theaters around Arizona. All right, this week's all about Tucson and our amazing partners on Romero Fest both have some amazing 
work on their digital stages right now. Winding Road Theater Ensemble is coming at you soon with The Time is Out of Joint, a Shakespeare project adapted and directed by Molly Lyons. And that's going to be February 26th through March 14th. But right now, you can catch Scoundrel and Scamp Theater's Frozen Fluid by Fly Jamerson. Fly Jamerson, might we say, amazing name. That's going to be playing through February 27th. I streamed it last night. It's pretty amazing. And headed up to Phoenix, Murder for Two is still playing in their outdoor theater, so please check that out. And up at Arizona Broadway Theater, you can still catch Walk on the Line. So exciting stuff happening right now. And it's time once again for our Black History feature, where we turn our proverbial spotlight on people, actors, uh, producers, technicians, people making a difference on Arizona stages today, making history today. This week's spotlight, Walter Belcher grew up in Tucson, Arizona, and has been a staple of the Arizona arts community since attending Amphitheater High School. As a professional vocalist, actor, and director, Walter has entertained audiences worldwide and has combined his love of the arts with his other passions, youth development, and social justice as the show director for the international singing group Up With People. Residing in Phoenix, Arizona, he continues to use the art as a tool to affect social change. He most recently joined Mesa Community College's Footlight Forum, facilitating a virtual workshop on diversity, equity, inclusion, and kids. You can also find Walter on the BIPOC theater podcast, Sip and Tea in the Balcony, unpacking the responsibility the Arizona theater community plays in celebrating diversity and promoting inclusion. Thank you, Walter, for your work, and keep on getting into good trouble. Well, that's all we have time for this week, but again, thank you for joining us. We hope you had a great time. We hope you have a great weekend, and see you.